Hey, welcome to Three Crows Forge. This is Kelly, a.k.a. Porkchop. But I'm not at Three Crows Forge. I'm at Corgi Forge here with Dan Schreiner. He's a good fortune buddy of mine. Dan, nice to see you again. Good yeah. to see you, Kelly. So today, we're going to be forging with a coal forge instead of a propane forge. This is the more traditional style of uh, forging when you think of blacksmiths. This is typically what you think about coal, smoke, and, and red hot metal. So uh, what we're going to do today is kind of have Dan go over uh, how the setup goes for this and the pros and cons of a uh, coal forge compared to a propane forge. Dan's only got very limited uh, knowledge or uh, time with a propane forge. But um, we're going to go over that and uh, hopefully spread some knowledge about what's going on here. So... Uh, we can get started, Dan. I'm gonna turn it over to you for a little bit and, and let right. you explain. Sure. All right. So, um, everybody, this is a, a coal forge that um that I built by hand, and I'll kind of point out the parts of it. Um, so we'll begin with the top. This is a, just a tabletop here that's got a lot of room to to pile coal on it, and the uh, the center of it is where the business happens. And this is a fire pot, um, and it's got sloped sides on it. Um, and uh, welded this together it's it's heavy steel um, the sloped sides are about three-eighths inch thick metal um, to withstand the heat of uh, the fire we're, we're basically talking um, up to 2500 2800 degrees uh, so it's very it gets very very hot um, the, in the bottom of your fire pot so this is where you build your coal fire in the, um, the bottom of this fire pot is um, a lobed design to what's called a clinker breaker and we'll, we'll take a shot below the, the forge to see the what's underneath but air comes up um, via a fan um, comes up through this lobed design this square hole in the bottom of the forge that lets the air lets um lets the air up and the device in the bottom of it is called a clinker breaker and as coal burns we'll get more into that as we start our fire or we'll talk a little bit about coal but but coal forms impurities when it burns and those settle to the bottom of your fire pot and every once in a while you've got to break those impurities up to keep the airflow going to keep your fire nice and hot. So you've got sort of a rotating grate at the bottom of your fire pot to, uh, to let that air continue to go. So this is the, uh, the clinker breaker and it's actually formed in sort of like a triangular lobe so that when you turn it it'll, it'll move up and it'll break up any um, any clinker that forms in the bottom of here and then, then you just turn it back that way but it's got the holes there that let the air continue to, to flow up to uh, to keep your fire nice and hot. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, underneath the forge and we'll explain the parts underneath the forge. Down here this part of a forge is it's a French term and it's called a tuir and a tuir um, basically allows air to go up into the uh, the fire pot but it's got a, a means of emptying ash that falls down. This is an ash dump, it's weighted. So you'll, you'll get a buildup of ash in the bottom of that pot and it'll fall down between those uh, holes between the clinker breaker and every once in a while, you gotta open up your ash dump and dump your ashes out. On the other side of the tweer is where the air comes in. So would you call that an ash hole? An ash hole, yes. <laughs> it's, um, so this is where, um, the fan, this is a forced air fan, and actually I built this enclosure around a um, sort of a heavy duty bathroom fan. Um, so the air comes out here and that's controlled by a foot pedal. So every time I press on that pedal, um, the fan turns on and blows the air up there and um, you need quite a bit of air to get the, the fire good and hot. So you've either got to have an electrically powered fan um, or um, a bellows, you know, if you're talking really old fashioned, or um, a hand crank blower. A lot of times you'll see at a, a blacksmithing demo, you'll see them turning a hand crank. But you've got to have a, a, a means of forcing air up into your fire pot to get the fire as, as hot as we need it for forging. Now, speaking of hand cranks, back right behind there, we've got an old school uh, yeah, fire we, pot. Yeah, let's, we, let's take a look at that real quick. All right, so this is a, um, a what's called a rivet forge. Um, it's one that I um, inherited from a friend, and I'm going to have to do some work on it to kind of redo it. 
but it's a smaller forge that was technically used to make back in the day when they would make rivets for you know steel girder construction they would heat up the rivets in a small forge like this and toss them up to the um, the guys that would actually use hammers to rivet the steel girders together um, but this is a good example of an old school forge where you've got a hand crank blower on it and that is the means of, of getting um, your air supply up into your um, your pile of burning coal um, so this is kind of old school I'm gonna like I say I'm gonna redo this and uh, have a nice little portable forge to take with me to do demos so Dan, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about the coal and, and the differences between using coal and propane and, and what you've got to deal with, with uh, dealing with coal, basically. Right, right. Okay, so um, again, so coal is a traditional solid fuel um, used in blacksmithing. Um, this type of coal that we're going to use, um, really that all most blacksmiths use, is called bituminous coal. And I'll actually show you what it looks like in its raw state. This is bituminous coal and it is a a soft high grade of coal. Um, it's a higher grade of coal than than what you think about that, that people often burn to heat their homes. It's, it's sort of a specialty coal. Um, it burns hotter than um, home heating oil. Um, anthracite coal um, is a harder type of coal. Um, but this this uh, is, is called bituminous coal, and not only does it burn hot, but um, it burns and it produces very little in the way of those waste minerals that I'm, I'm telling you about that's called clinker. The higher the quality of coal, the less, uh, the less waste or less clinkers um, it produces. Um, so one of the things about a, a coal forge is it's getting harder and harder to find this high-grade coal because the mines are just not pulling it out. There's less and less demand um, for coal mining in general, but it's going to, as time goes on, it's gonna get harder and harder to, uh, to get, a, get a hold of coal. Um, this costs in and around $20 for a 50 pound bag. Um, but like I say, as time goes on, it's, it's going to get harder and harder to find coal. There's environmental reasons to move away from coal. But if you think about it, all the blacksmiths that, that burn coal um, produce very little in the, in, the, uh, in the way of waste products compared to like industrial coal generating plants. Right. Um, so um, <laughs> we blacksmiths, we need to stock up on this stuff um, while we can still get it. Um, but it is the traditional solid fuel for, for um, you know, for, for blacksmithing. Other things that uh, blacksmiths use for fuel you can use charcoal you can use wood um, there's even reports of blacksmiths using, using uh, like field corn um, dried field corn um, as a fuel really? uh, yeah for for uh, I haven't haven't seen it but I've heard about it um, oh. as a fuel but mm -hmm. um I really like the tradition a lot of uh, blacksmiths really like the traditional feel of, of using coal it's what most of us think about when we think of of, um, of blacksmithing, old school, you know, good old old school blacksmithing. Um, so I want to keep that that tradition, that history alive, and um, it's kind of fun to work with. Well, um, next thing we'll move into is is kind of starting our fire. We'll continue to talk a little bit about um, coal and the advantages and, and disadvantages of using this as a fuel versus propane. Now the different types of stuff up here you've got your coal you've got your coke and you've got your clinkers right so what a lot of you so I just dumped the fresh coal here but you see a lot of stuff remaining from um, like the last fires that I've built um, and some of this um, a lot of this actually when you burn coal when you first start it on fire um, again this is soft and it's full of um, petroleum volatile you know derivatives okay to, for lack of a better word it's got sulfur in it too when you burn this off initially all of those volatiles burn off so does the sulfur burn off this raw coal will produce a lot of coal smoke it's kind of nasty but as it burns off as those volatiles burn out of it it turns into coke uh c-o-k-e coke 
is in essence purified coal that's burned all the volatiles off. This is very light, this piece. It feels like a piece of lava rock. Right. It's, and um, this piece probably weighs as much as that does. Exactly. All of the all of the, the volatiles have burned off of this, and this is basically a chunk of pure carbon, and this is is fuel too, okay? And this burns clean, it produces very little smoke. But as we burn raw coal, it will pile it up around our fire. The heat from the fire burns the volatiles off of the raw coal that's around the fire and actually turns it into this coke. And it's technically, it's coke that we burn. You keep raking in from the perimeter of your fire, you're raking in this, this uh, coal that's turned into coke. And one of the things you'll see us do is when we, when we start the fire and we put a bunch of that fresh coal around there is we'll sprinkle water over the coal. It seems odd, you know, why would you sprinkle water on it? We put the fire out, but actually sprinkling the water on it helps turn the, um, the pure coal into coke. It helps it turn it into these nice chunks of, of coke, which end up giving us nice clean burning fuel. So it's sort of a process. So the water just kind of helps with a slow burn instead of a quick burn on the on the coal. Exactly. I'm, it, it, I think it helps it get the get rid of the volatiles and helps it form up into these nice light chunks of, of coke. Now I had mentioned the, a byproduct of burning coal too. A lot of the waste minerals, things that are part of this raw coal that will not actually combust, those settle down into the bottom of your fire pot and form what are called clinkers. And it's just sort of a hard minerally it's almost a metallic clinky, it makes a clink sound when you clink it against the metal, but this is like un, unburnt remnants or, or waste product of it, and um, that, that forms in the bottom of there, and again, every now and again we've got to fish that out to keep this open for good airflow, but the, um, the higher the quality of smithing coal, the, uh, the less clinker it produces, and, and I've lucked into some really good quality um, bituminous coal lately where it really does not produce much in the way of clinkers. Anybody that burns, um, has like a, a coal burning um, boiler or furnace, the, the people that do um, home heating with coal, you also get clinkers too when you do that and that has to be constantly cleaned out. The, uh, the old coal powered uh, steam locomotives, they would have had they would have produced clinker too, where it's something that you constantly have to worry about, mm -hmm. constantly have to clean out. So that's one of the, um, the the facts of life about coal is when you're doing your fire, it takes maintenance, and one of those is getting these clinkers out of your way. Um, What's the nickname that your mentor gave those? Yeah, yeah Drew, my uh, my nickname uh, calls these dragon turds, <laughs> um, clinker. So. so here we've got coal, coke, and clinkers slash dragon turds. Right. You can even see that's got sort of a metallic, mm -hmm. shiny metallic look to it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's get the light in the fire, shall we? Let's do that. The, so the easiest way to um, light a good fire in a fire pot is to make what's called a donut out of some newspaper. We're going to unfold a few sheets of newspaper together pull them out to their full size. Not the word, sir. And then, <laughs> oh no. Then we're gonna kind of curl up the edges into a wheel or a donut. Like so. And we're gonna poke a hole in the middle of our donut to let air through, got your hole. I'm gonna stick that down in the middle of our fire pot. So another really good thing to, to use to help start a fire is um, it's pine cones. So we're gonna put a few um, dried pine cones in here too because they um, they burn up pretty quickly. Mm. Um, and they smell nice. Yeah. Put a few pine cones in there. Then we're gonna put some chunks of um, coke, because coke starts on fire pretty quickly. Ba basically, remember, it's pure carbon. Um, so that starts on fire pretty easily for us. So you can break that up, that coke up pretty easily, too. Um, 
Although I've not seen it for sale, you can buy Coke by itself as a as a uh, fuel too for blacksmithing, but I've never seen really like, hey, bag, 50 pound bags of Coke for sale. Um, now, if you were just to buy the Coke, would that, do you think that would take away from um, actually just having the the coal? Um, or well, having having never used just the the pure the pure coke as a fuel, um, I guess it would it would probably be an easier fire to maintain because you're you're not worried about converting coal into coke um, mm -hmm. as part of the process. You're basically just raking in pure, clean, clean burning fuel into the fire you really wouldn't have to worry about too many clinkers at that point yeah either. exactly because it's uh, a lot of it's it's basically it's purified it's turned into pure carbon mm -hmm. all right so we've got we've got um the, the paper we've got some pine cones we've got some coke and then we're just going to put some um raw coal in there um if you put too much raw coal in it um it's just going to produce a really nasty amount of smoke when you get started this this will produce some smoke, no doubt about it. And um, as it burns for a few minutes, this raw coal, that smoke will burn away. Um, but what we're going to do now is we can we can use any of this this old um, leftover coke. And, and mind you, some of this is is dust here that's not going to burn. But there's plenty of little pieces of coke that will will burn too. But we're going to rake. Kind of build us like a nest around this thing because we're as we do our fire we're going to rake our our coal our, our coke that's um turned from the uh from the coal into coke into the fire and that's our fuel so we can put this raw coal all around the edge going to go ahead and start our fan and grab our lighter going you can see right away that that um that raw coal is giving off that uh that smoke burning off sulfur sometimes you can see a yellow tinge to that smoke as well which would be the sulfur burning off i'm sure your neighbors love it initially it can get pretty smoky does not stay the smoke. Just gonna kind of rake some of the uh, coke in there. One thing I want to uh, recommend safety wise is wear your safety glasses every time you um, blacksmith. Um, long sleeves are a good idea too. It's just a really hot day. Um, the bottom line is every once in a while you're going to get a hot ember land on your arm. You're going to get some some uh, little burns, but that's that's why long sleeves are nice. But uh, it's a really hot day today. Um, and humid. And humid. So as I mentioned earlier, um, wetting down the coal on the outside actually helps it turn into coke. So we're going to. wet our raw coal down with a little bit of water. And how long does it typically take for you to get your fire about where you want it? Oh shoot, probably only about five minutes. Um, it's it's all ready. We could put we could put uh, metal in there right now, you know, and, and it uh, 
be good to go, you know. Um, the one thing too, when it comes to fire maintenance on um, a coal fire is, obviously the coal burns away and it becomes hollow in there if you don't continue to rake fuel into it. Um, so you don't want to get a hollow fire. You just, um, you just keep gradually raking the coke into the center to keep that from becoming hollow, but keep a good fire going. Um, so there's, I mean, to me, it's it's really satisfying the uh, the process that the fact that yes, there is some work involved to maintaining this fire, but it's actually kind of what makes it fun. Um, you know, it's vintage, and if you think about it. Um, if you like go to these gothic cathedrals and you see all of this gorgeous ornamental artwork all of that was done on traditional um, solid fuel burning forges um, propane forges you know they do have a lot of benefits to them they're very clean burning um, they, they're not as messy this is coal a coal fire is a messy fire I mean you'll when we're done here we'll have to take a shower because you get you know you get black coal not, dust on we're not going to shower together Maybe. Well, darn it. But <laughs> but um but it is it, it's a messy process. If you do this inside of a building, um, the walls are gonna start turning black and and uh, sometimes you'll get you know you'll get coal dust in your nose where you blow your nose out and it's black nastiness. So it's it's kind of a dirty process, but um, it's truly the traditional way that all this gorgeous metalwork you see in these old cathedrals and that. Um, all these fences and things were made using this old traditional method. So, um, other advantages, okay, so so what are the advantages of a, a coal forge over, for instance, a propane forge? Well, and the disadvantages. So we talked about that um, the coal can be hard to get a hold of, um, kind of a dirty process, that's why I like to do it outside. Um, but, um, and of course there's fire maintenance, you gotta keep working this fire to keep it maintained. Um, but a coal fire will get very, very hot. I mean, we're talking 2,500, maybe even up to as hot as 3,000 degrees. Definitely hot enough to, to melt steel, to cause steel to actually burn, which is an interesting phenomenon, but it actually degrades and sparks and, and, and burns away because you get that fire this hot. So you can get it basically as hot as you need in a, um, in a coal forge um, sometimes much hotter than a propane, uh, or, or somewhat hotter than a propane forge. Um, other advantage is, because this is wide open, you can put big pieces of, of metal work on this fire where you can't fit them unless you've got a giant propane forge, but you can work on bigger pieces and oddly shaped pieces on a, uh, on a coal forge that you, you, know, you just simply cannot um, put into a propane forge. Um, so in, in going to that, um, you you have a more direct line of what's being heated up, and whereas in my propane forge, if I take a eight foot or eight inch piece of steel and I only want to work towards the middle of it, I've got to stick that whole piece in, and the whole piece gets red hot and more liable to bend where I don't want it to bend or do anything. Where here, if I want to get that middle piece hot, I stick stick the middle right over top of the fire exactly we're in like this end this would stay cool this would stay cool but the center could be hot um so in, in my particular forge here we probably have about a 10 10 inch by 10 inch um fire area that, that contacts the metal um so yeah that is that is different if we were working like say on a large piece of, of scroll work or fence work we could put just the part that we want to get hot in here but mind you, the like one of the advantages of that propane forge is it heats up that piece evenly, generally, it depends on how your burners are laid out in your propane mm -hmm. forge. You can heat up that piece over its whole length um, evenly. You can very specifically control the amount of heat in a propane forge where you can stick like three or four pieces of metal in there at the same time. They'll heat up to a nice, yellow orange perfect forging temperature um whereas a a coal forge you can easily burn things in it by letting them get too hot so you've got to keep a close eye on when you've got metal in a coal forge 
um, you've got to keep a close eye on it because it's very easy to let it stay in there too long, um, let it get too hot, and then it burns, and then that kind of ruins your piece. Uh, so, more um, than once, uh, when I was <clears throat> doing my beginner class, stick a piece of metal in there, you turn around, you say one you know, little sentence or two, you turn around, and your piece is sparking. It does not take long at all. This thing gets hot. Exactly. It gets, it, it gets very, very hot. So, um, so a propane forge is good for what we call production forging. If I wanted to make like five bottle openers, I could stick five pieces of metal into that propane forge at the same time, let them heat up, and take one piece out, come over, hammer it, stick it back in, and just rotate through those five pieces. I would never have to worry about it getting too hot where they would start burning. Um, so I could more efficiently move through making small objects in a propane forge than you can. You can, you know, if you're, if, as you become better and better working with coal, yes, you can keep, you can put multiple pieces in there, but for heaven's sakes, you've got to keep a close eye on it or, or you'll burn it. You'll burn it in a heartbeat. So before we stick our first piece of metal in there. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. And cheers to you watching. Yeah, this is one of the best beers out there, Loose Cannon well, by Heavy Seas. It's, it's relative. <laughs> P.S. We are in no way, shape, or form uh, <laughs> uh, affiliated with, with Loose, loose Cannon. With, yeah, with Loose Cannon or Heavy Seas. This is a good IPA. However, I'll start drinking it more often if I do get... <laughs> <laughs> we do get a sponsorship yeah i don't know if, if y'all can see this here but dan's uh anvil is a different shape than what my anvil is mine is more of the more of the english an english style anvil and, right and yours is uh well it is a european style of anvil um that one at that anvil right there is actually um forged um i believe in turkey it's, it's the brand name is kanka mm -hmm. um a very high quality anvil um, you when it comes to buying an anvil you want a drop forged anvil if you can get it you don't want a cast anvil like if you go to Harbor Freight and you buy a $40 anvil that's going to be cast metal forging they're no good they're no I've good got, they, they got just, one <laughs> yeah they just don't hold up I mean it's okay if you're a beginner to um to start playing with but eventually you'll want to get a forged um, a forged um, anvil and for the money this is about a $600 anvil uh, I think it's about 115 pounds if you buy yourself um, a forged anvil like that yeah it's painful to invest that money up front but it'll you take care of it, it's gonna last you a lifetime it's something Where, you can either pass down, pass to, your down to your kids or exactly and um, that'll you know for $600 that's just a, a lifetime investment that, that I'll get a lot of use out of mm -hmm. All right, everyone, we're, um, we're gonna make an X, S hook right now. So we've got a uh, piece of quarter inch square stock here. Um, I've measured off a piece um, that's seven inches long, made a couple of marks, one three and a half inches down, one seven inches down. Um, another thing you can do too, if you, it's, it's nice to keep an extra piece of uh, the stock attached there while you're working on at least one end of it. Um, but you can either make a, if you know this is gonna be the end of your piece, you can bring it over to your anvil and um, use a, a, I'm getting a brain for it. What is that? Um, the, uh, I, I just call it, call it a cutoff. The cutoff, yeah. The cutoff and make a, make a mark on there. And the marks are easier to see than, than the mark, than the, uh, the ink or whatever you might be using. There we go. So once that heats up, we'll be able to see where we put that little ding. That's a hot cut off. That's the reason I just kind of crushed that a little bit. Yep. I should have let that. I should have let. Should have heated that up. That's all right. Um, we, anyways, we've got the materials and. Yeah, we got the know-how to sharpen that puppy right back up. Yep. But, um, all right. So we're gonna heat. We're gonna heat up the end of it, and we're gonna hammer it into a taper because we're gonna make an S hook out of here, which is gonna have a tapered end on on both ends and a, hopefully a nice, um, nice gentle S shape to it. So the first thing is we're gonna do. Is that what they do, call an S hook? Exactly. Oh. Uh, as opposed to say a Q hook. Uh, those are hard. Q we'll make one of those hard. next video. Exactly. <laughs> Q hooks are hard. 
I gotta sure. say, I've never seen a Q hook, but <laughs> damn it, if anybody can do it, it's us, yeah, right? We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, you hit that metal cold. What are the two sins of, of a blacksmith that'll send you to hell? Exactly. Um, hitting cold metal or metal that's gotten too cold, because you can't move cold metal, and uh, selling your stuff too cheap. That's um, why I just give it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Whatever you make. I mean, there is there is a market for... Oh, look at that. See? Yeah, right away, it's already orange. So it, it, it's hard to see during the daylight, too, how hot we really are. If we were in a dark um, a dark workshop, the colors would show up better. But really, optimally, hammering temperature or hammering color would be yellow. Orange to yellow. Um, but yeah, I went over that in my last video, how sunlight cools your metal. Exactly, where you're not really seeing that it's actually hotter than you think it is. Um, and I know it's bad for you, but I love staring into the fire. It's so entrancing, but... It's true, it, but it, it, we're, we're burning our retinas out as we speak. <laughs> might as well be staring at the sun, huh? Right. A good reason for drawing a point on um, the horn of your anvil, this is called the horn of your anvil, is if you do this on the flat part of your anvil and you try to lift your piece up and you try to hit it right here, you can put dings into your anvil, um, dents, which there are a few dents in my, in my anvil, but if you do it on the, the point of your anvil, you'll never mess up that flat surface. Yeah, I do mine on the corner with the tilt up and that way when I hit my hammer actually comes off the side exactly yeah you can also you can also do it this way that's this that's, way right here too so you're never you're never hitting the anvil at the edge of your hammer so what kind of hammer is this so this is um this is a a, a well you you'd call it a um a cross peen hammer here mm -hmm. because you've got this is called a, a cross peen right here get your um, mind out Everybody has heard of a ball peen hammer. A ball peen hammer has a ball shape on the end of it. Um, very common. I mean, everybody's heard the word ball peen hammer. Very common, but we don't have one. <laughs> we generally don't really. Hey, is that one? Yeah, yeah okay. there we go. Yeah, so this is a ball peen hammer. Everybody's heard of a ball peen, but this is the peen end of it. And uh, <laughs> he said peen. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> It's rounded, but this is a cross peen hammer here. Um, the face of this hammer has been rounded so it doesn't make dents in my work. And I made a custom made a custom handle here, which has kind of got a rectangular shape that so um, that I really like the way it fits in my hand. Um, he likes the way the peen fits in his hand. Exactly. <laughs> We're going to see if we can refine this point a little bit. Now you're drawing it to a sharp point at this? A semi, yeah, semi-sharp. You can get to see a picture, kind of a semi-sharp point. Um, doesn't have to be super sharp. Again, this is this is an S hook. Um, we're not trying to make a, a fishing hook to be able to spear somebody with or whatever. That's next project, right. after the Q hook. So, um, so we've got kind of a, a, uh, a blunt or a, a, a very sharp point or a sharper point put on there. We could taper it down a little bit more if we want. It's all in how we want the, uh, the, um, the S hook to be finished out. So the next thing we're gonna do is, I'm, I'm guessing we should probably um, start the S thing and then we'll end up, I'll, I'm gonna think I'm gonna make half of the S and then we'll cut it off and make the other half of, uh, point the other end of it. Okay. And, um, and then finish our S. We'll use tongs at that point to, uh, to handle it. So heat it up a little bit further back and start making the first half of the S. It's been a little while since I've made an S hook. I had to make a bunch of them to earn my my beginner certificate in blacksmithing, but um I still gotta do that. He's still gotta finish his beginner certificate. Um but the whole thing is um some of the first things you learn to make as a blacksmith are S hooks, um, like a, a wall hook or sort of a J-shaped hook that you can hang like hooks on and such. 
Um, you learn to make leaves. That's a, a another that was, beginner. That project. was my last uh, video. Last was video. Making a leaf. Yep. So when you when we um, begin to learn how to make these these simple designs, these S hooks, um, very useful to have. But it just kind of teaches you how to manipulate the metal, how to um, try to make a very even S shape, which is. It's harder than it looks. It takes some um, takes practice to get it nice and even the, the shape of the S. Now, when uh, when I have people out of my forge, I tend to tell them that it's almost like manipulating clay. That's how soft the metal is when you've got it up to heat. Right. It uh, it doesn't take much to to move it or to mess it up. However, it's fairly easy to fix depending on how bad you mess it up. That's true. You can you can usually bend it back. Now, if you crack it, you're kind of screwed, right? Unless you know how to forge well, but that's going to be later on in the video series here. I'll tell you what we're going to do, though, is we're going to actually before we, we start making our S's, we're going to draw this taper out and then kind of put a little um, little curl on the end of it. Oh, we're going to make it pretty. We're going to make it pretty. All oh, right, I like pretty. That's why I hang out with you. <laughs> Now, do you round out your taper before you put the curl in, or do you leave it squared? Um, it, I guess it all depends on the look that we're after. Right. Um, I mean, because we could, we could keep this as a sort of a rectangular S hook, or we could make it a round S hook. I think for this first one, we'll um, we'll keep it square. Okay. Keep it squared up. Okay. So we've drawn, we've tapered that out kind of nice, and I think we can. Uh, We'll do it a little bit more and then we'll make our, uh, we'll curl our end on it a little bit. We'll make just a little bit thinner on the end and we'll do our curl. All I gotta say is Dan would be, or uh, Drew would be very uh, disappointed in you. How was that? Oh, that I, yeah, that I hammered cold steel on my hot cutoff. No, that you have your cutoff. Still in there? While you're forging. Yes. That's a big no-no. Hmm. That will uh, injure you very quickly. Well, it'll run. It, it can get in your way for sure. The one, the one habit that that Drew tried to break me of, and it took me a while, is to leave your hammer at the anvil. Absolutely. Um, when I was taking my beginner class. All right. So we've really got that drawn down to a nice sharp point. I'm going to heat it up a little bit more, and then we're going to do that curl on the end. But. Um, you're, it's it's extra work. In other words, if you're if you're carrying your hammer with you and setting it down over here, you're just creating extra work for yourself. So be good about leaving your hammer on the end. And mind you, every time you heat this up, you really only have about 20 seconds or so to work for it before it starts cooling down to the point where the the metal is no longer as malleable as you want it to be. So efficiency, having your anvil close to your fire is really very important. Unless you're one of those hardcore blacksmiths that keeps their metal red hot just by hitting it so hard and so often. Exactly. Man, those guys trip me out. Some guys like their uh, coal forge like that. They like the paper. They'll take a piece around and just beat it until it's red hot. And then <laughs> stick it on the uh, newspaper. Or Does that have, have anything to do with wearing a kill? I think that kind of... It, gives you some superpowers. So we, I didn't we, say I did that. We've, made a, we've did. made a curl on the end of that. Driving me to drink, Dan. <laughs> so just the, the mechanical energy that Kelly imparts to seal sometimes by hammering, hitting the cold stuff, heats it up hot enough to forge. Inertia, mm -hmm. friction. Kinetic energy. Yeah, look that up. That's a big word, kinetic energy. And even though this looks like we're just, oh, get the metal hot, beat it, there is a whole lot of science behind blacksmithing. And um, if you don't believe me, look up the difference between mild steel and 4140. Look up the difference between those two. And in between that, you're gonna find there's probably about 50 different grades of steel. And beyond that, another hundred types. Right. It's it's incredible right. how much steel is there, how hot you have to get it, and right. you know, the hardening. Uh, what uh, 
if you harden steel, what you've got to do depending on the yeah, grade. Exactly. Of the steel. If you're making like knives or tools or tempering it, hardening it, um, there is. There's a lot of science to it. All right, so I'm going to bring this out of the fire. We're going to cool that, that little curl tip that I made. Just the tip. Just the tip. Because if we don't cool that and I hammer on it, it'll start to bend more. But, but if I cool it, I'll be able to hammer on it and start forming that S shape we're after. Going back to the different types of steel. I'm going to watch you curl this because look at that. That's professional, ladies and gentlemen. Now we need to kind of go in the opposite direction. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's a matter, so here's where we're at right now. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is we're going to end up, we're going to heat that up, cut it off, and then we're going to taper the other end and then, then curl this hopefully into a nice even S hook for you. But going back to the different types of steel, this is cast iron. Cast iron um, is almost impossible to forge or weld because of the uh, chemical composition of it. It's almost like pig iron. You don't know what, what type of impurities there are it's in it. It's very granular, the, the substance or the way the metal uh, molecules line up, very granular. Um, and and um, I do work with guys that have welded cast iron, and they say it's almost as dirty as carbon oxide. It, wow. it, it's really, really nasty stuff to, to work with. It sputters all over the place just because of the chemical composition and, and how it's formed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll on that rivet for just it's going to be easier for me to, to build a new type of probably a square shaped forge table and on um, the tweer underneath. Um, but cast iron is a very tough metal, it's like really, really tough. Um, I think cast iron skillets, those last yeah. forever, you know? Um, um, there's a uh, YouTube channel that I watch, uh, Demolition Ranch. Right. Took a nine millimeter to a cast iron skillet, blocked the bullet. Wow. Put a dent in it, but I mean, you pay $40 for a cast iron skillet or, you know, $300 for a bolt for your vest. Just cover yourself in uh, cast iron skillets. Ca cast iron skillets, and, and you're good to go. Right. As long as they don't go above nine millimeter. Above that, man, they you're just gonna go right through. Yeah. Man. Yeah. The 45 punched a hole in it like this. Rough. Right. Like I wonder if I'm gonna find my mark that I that I tried to make in cold metal. Um, just drag it along until yeah. the uh, until the thing catches. One thing about a coal forge is if you're in the direct line of where the smoke is blowing you can taste it it tastes like sulfur mm. if not we're gonna pick a spot we're gonna pick a spot it's, it's getting it's cooling off so i think we're gonna i think we're gonna pick a spot because we we have the ability to even it up anyway um true true we're just going to pick a reasonable spot and cut it off, and then we'll even up our S. Um, so anyways, you, <laughs> you make that cutoff mark, heat it up, and then hit it on your, your hot cutoff. That's called a hardy. I'm getting a brain fart, but that's called a, a hot cut hardy tool. A hardy. H-A-R-D. Hardy. Y. H-A-R-D-Y. All right, no more beer for you. <laughs> now the thing about the hardy hole is that you can put a plethora of different tools in here as long as they fit that hole. Yeah. yeah. Again, like my filter. <laughs> um, <laughs> plethora of different tools. And you don't cut all the way through. Right. Cut almost all the way through and then you can just bend it off like that. All right, now we get to see your tong to tong 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 to tongs. All right, so we're going to heat up the other end and draw that out into a nice taper. And we'll put a little curl on the end of it, and then we'll shape it into an X.
Okay, so we got somewhat of a taper. We're going to draw a little bit more taper before we make our curl on the end. Oh, you didn't check your ash hole lately, have you? No, you got to keep that ash hole <laughs> open. Nice and clean. <laughs> <laughs> clean and open. Put a link on my Facebook page to your YouTube uh, channel once you get this uh, up and up and going. Absolutely. Right. Another tip when it comes to hammering is a blacksmith that that it's um, taken me a while to learn is you don't want to grip the hammer too hard and you don't want to put your thumb on the top of it for one thing but you don't want to grip the hammer too hard you want the hammer try to get the hammer to do as much of the work as you can it it, uh, it wrecks your elbow when you grip um, the hammer too hard and you'll start getting tendonitis um, I got it in my shoulder and my elbow as of right now from right. from learning that but there's a almost a snap when you got it right when exactly you're letting you're letting the inertia of the hammer pivoting in your hand do a lot of the work for you um, and it, it and it saves your joints well, there, I, I saw a uh, a forge page on Facebook and again I'm not affiliated with with them but I thought they had the most clever forge name ever what's that sore elbow forge well it does <laughs> I mean it, it if you if you grip those handles too tight, it really tears up your elbow. You wouldn't believe how it tears up your elbow. And that's um, that's when people come out to my forge. Of course, if they don't have any real experience using a hammer, that's the first thing they do. Like, no, 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 baseball, yeah. baseball bat. And and another thing is start out with a use the smallest hammer, weight wise that you can to do the work that you need to do. Do not use bigger hammer heads unless you have to have it to move more metal because it, it, again, it's just more wear and tear on your muscles and your, your ligaments and, and that. that uh, and even then, if, if you've got a piece that big where you've got to use a big piece. Use get, two hands and have a friend hold it for you. Exactly, have a striker. Yeah. I've got to remember which way I need to curl the, curl the end. It'll come up towards this. Will it come up towards me? No, it'll come up towards this way. It'll go this way. Yep. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. right, a so lot of blacksmithing is reverse engineering stuff. It is. <laughs> it's, um, there's a lot of, um... This is why you need to pay attention in geometry, okay? <laughs> because it's, this is shapes and, and geometry and physics. Chemistry. Right. Don't sleep through those classes, kids. <laughs> now look at me. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, yeah, if you hold that up, you can see where it, uh, this is going to be one of the S shapes here. And so this side is going to have to match the bottom. Right. So this that's is where geometry be, comes into play. Yeah, that's going to be right. When that curls out, that's going to have the same same thing, the same shape as that one does. Something that simple can, you can sit there and look at it. Is that right? Is that the right direction? Is that the right direction? Sit there and look at it for five minutes to, to make sure you're doing it right. But if we, um, if we twisted that in the wrong direction, it's not that difficult to take a pair of pliers and untwist that curl and fix it. But you can't do that too many times because you'll end up snapping it. Yeah, you'll end up snapping it off. But, um. So now kind of comes the fun part is getting that other, um, the other direction of the S and then kind of evening everything up to make it look like a nice, gentle, even S shape. Um, can be a little tricky, but um, that's, the, that's the thing about you earning your beginner certificate is you just practice consistency. You practice developing an eye of, 
okay, that, that needs to be move, move a little bit that way or whatever to make it even. Um, oops. Starting to get a little bit hollow on our fire, so we're going to rake some more. Oh, look at that. That's that pure Perk. stuff going in there. Yeah, that Coke perks, mm -hmm. perks it right back up, man. No biggie, no straight through. Even even using learning to manipulate things with tongs takes a little bit of time to it get does. at it. Um, <laughs> didn't get much done that time, but that's more but, of an uh, F. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Yeah. Sort of a I don't know. That's a ladle. <laughs> a ladle hook. Um, So we're getting close. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't. This one here has that actual nice round shape. So I just need to round him out a little bit more. I think and we'll have a pretty good looking S. Um, I believe uh, Da Vinci was saying that the uh, beauty of definition uh, or the definition of beauty is symmetry. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. So your work needs to have symmetry in order to make it look good. Right. Well, depending on what you're making. True. But I think that's part of the beginner class is making sure that all of your work has the symmetry to make sure that you know what you're doing or, or at least know how to manipulate it to the point where... Uh, yes, and, 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 and that you can repeat it, that you can make several pieces that look the same. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're making like a scroll work or whatever, like this S design could be part of a beautiful piece of metal scroll work where we have several S's composing it and they would want them all to look the same. Right, exactly. Shabby. We'll drive them out a little bit. A little bit more. That would be an S for Shriner. Also stands for superlative, super. Um, you know, a lot of good things that S stands for. But Everything not, in my head went negative, and I'm not allowed well, to Well, he's thinking of a four letter word that starts with S, but I'm thinking no, that, that was. Like six. But that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't look too bad for an S hook. No, it right. doesn't. So, all right. The uh, the artist's work, worst critic is the artist. So very true, very true. Um, uh, or or other blacksmiths. Yeah, because <laughs> well, they'll that's... call you out in a heartbeat. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. Um, um, all right. So there, we've got an S hook made by Mr. Dane Schreiner himself. Nice little symmetrical S. Almost symmetrical. I'm gonna. Um, Chide him later on this. <laughs> yeah, I could use a, a little Joking. bit more dressing, but you're you're right. Uh, uh, ranch or Italian? <laughs> yeah, a little li little more straightening up, but yeah. it's pretty close. It, it looks really really good. Um, All right, well that's the time at uh, Corgi Forge here. We're gonna sit back and have a beer and maybe do some uh, try some forge welding. We'll see how the beers go down. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for joining, and as always, keep those fires lit. Have a good one.